presents Ellen DeGeneres. Starring in a command performance on One Night Stand. And now here's Ellen DeGeneres. Thank that that felt good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Good to be back in uh, Miami. This is uh, my favorite place in the land. And uh, well, it is. I mean, of course, you know I say that everywhere I go, but I mean it here. Great place. Man, everybody's so friendly, and I'm just hanging out at the beach today, and people coming up to me. This guy came up and said, hey, you know, you're on my towel. You know, it's just really great. <laughs> so uh, thanks for gathering here. In case you're not aware, I'm a comedian, and this is uh, an HBO special. And uh, it's, it's a weird job to be a comedian, I think, because, you know, you get a lot of people asking questions and, uh, you know, I guess the most commonly asked question I get, number one, would be, um, number one, what is your favorite land mammal? Then, <laughs> then, after that, number two, would be why I'm a comedian, how that happened. Was my family funny? Was my childhood weird? And um, I think I'm a comedian because of my dad. My dad was always playing practical jokes on me all the time. And I remember one time so vividly, I was seven years old, I was in the backyard playing, it was a real hot sunny day, and I ran into the kitchen to pour a glass of lemonade, because I used to just love lemonade. I still drink it. I don't drink it as much as I did when I was a little girl. I drink it all day long. Sometimes I drink too much, I'd get a little tummy ache, I'd be laying in bed at night going, Mom, I got a tummy ache! <laughs> anyway. Um, I was in the back and I went to the kitchen to get some lemonade and um, in the kitchen was my dad, my mom, all my brothers and sisters just standing there staring at me about to start laughing. I was like, what? I, I was seven, I didn't know. And my dad said, Ellen, honey, you were adopted and we've never liked you, so <laughs> we've sold you to a tribe of Iroquois Indians. They'll be here to pick you up in about an hour. We're going to go to a movie. Bye-bye. Good luck. <laughs> So, I lived in the Origines Mountains for about nine years with the Iroquois. <laughs> learning basket weaving and pottery making, and uh, I taught them that noise you make under the arm like that. <laughs> that was the skill I had. And it was customary to marry within the tribe at 13 and have several papooses, which I did. Anyway, nine years later, here comes trudging up the mountains, my dad, my mom, all my brothers and sisters, carrying a big thing of lemonade, going, we're just kidding, we love you, you're ours, come on home. <laughs> We went home and laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> well, and you know, the funny thing is, they weren't even real Indians. They were actors my dad hired to play Indians. <laughs> just to fool me, you know. Because I'll still see them today on an old rerun of a Love Boat or a movie of the week with McLean Stevenson, and I'll go, oh, hey, there's Running Steve, you know. <laughs> That's not his name, I know that now, but... He was always playing jokes. So I remember one time I, I was coming home from kindergarten. And, well, they told me it was kindergarten. I found out later I'd been working in a factory for two years. <laughs> joker, joker, joker. <laughs> you know. So it's good for a kid to know how to make gloves, though, at that age, I think. You need to know. So... It's a good job. I like being a comedian. The only bad thing about the job is that I have to fly everywhere I go uh, because, well, because you won't come to me. Actually, that's why. <laughs> if you just come to my house in groups of 20, I could come out in my bathrobe. Hello. It's not worked out that way. So I have to go now to these little tiny places where the little commuter planes have to take you. Have you been to those little eight-seater planes? The cockpit's open. You can see the pilot reading some manual, so you want to be a pilot. <laughs> It's just scary. Even the big planes now, you're just so jammed up next to everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm flying here the other day. The guy in front of me, his head is like this. I'm behind him. I'm... Hi. <laughs> Sitting right behind. <laughs> he, 
Could you turn that page? I'm done with that now. I'm trying to relax on the plane. This is me trying to relax. This is upright, recline. I think I went too far, actually. It was just, you see the difference there? Uncomfortable, comfortable. Ah, oh, that's much better. Now I can sleep. Not the guy in front of me. His seat came far enough back for me to do dental work on him, actually. <laughs> Which was good. He had a nasty molar that needed to come out and put up quite a fight. So that's all I had. I was back like that, and the flight attendant comes up to me towards the end of the flight and says, you're going to have to put your seat in the upright position for landing. <laughs> to make a difference because if we crash, live, <laughs> die. <laughs> like they're going to be surveying the crash site. Oh, gee, that's a shame. Her seat was reclined. <laughs> when will they learn? What was that, 30,000 feet? She could have made that. <laughs> if only she'd been upright. You know it and I know it. I'm just scared of, I have to make jokes about it because I get on a, fl on, a, on a plane sometimes three, four times a week. I mean, I just, and it's scary. I'm scared of flying. I don't know if, are you scared of flying? <laughs> See? The scary thing, I, first of all, I don't think we have to go that high. That is not necessary to be that high in the air. I think they're showing off those pilots. I think we could just go really, really fast, just a few feet off the ground, just, just high enough to miss animals. You're... The turbulence, I think, scares everybody, but the turbulence is a fear that we create. We put that in ourselves because we always imagine it to be more than it is. You know, but if you look at it like you go to an amusement park, you pay for that fear. You know, you pay for that scariness. So do what I do. As soon as you start to feel the turbulence, you just go, ah! so, I usually end up sitting alone that way, so that's, you can just stretch out. I just can't imagine choosing that job, wanting to be up in the air for your profession. I don't know. Do we have any flight attendants here tonight? Yeah. Okay, these bitches. They just have... <laughs> you and I hate them. I... Unless you know one, they're lovely. But the rest of them are just... They just have this attitude, you know? And they can afford to have the attitude because they have the power. They have the peanuts. <laughs> they have these six peanuts that we need that... It's six peanuts. Somebody could offer that to you on the street. I don't want that shit. Get that away from me, six peanuts. <laughs> on the plane. I didn't get my peanuts. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you going to eat yours? <laughs> They're good, aren't they? You can't get these on the ground. <laughs> Six peanuts, that's what they choose to give us. They will give you a meal, of course, if you're on a flight that lasts long enough, they'll bring you food, which is disgusting. I mean, you know, nobody ever says, you know, I can't finish that. Could you wrap that up for me? <laughs> what was that, pigeon? That's delicious. <laughs> it's horrible food, but we get so excited when we see that cart start coming down the aisle. <laughs> Here comes a cart, put down the tray. They're starting on the other side first. Hurry, hurry! They're gonna get their bad food first. 
put down your tray. It's horrible food. It's the tiniest food I've ever seen in my entire life. I guess they figure everything's relative. You get that high up, you look out the window. Well, it's as big as that house down there. I can't eat all that. Look at the size of that. That's as big as a house. I'm thinking I can eat all... Split that steak with me. That's a piece of meat. Any kind of meat that you get, chicken, steak, anything at all, has grill marks on each side. Like we actually believe there's an open flame grill in the front of the plane. Two more, Charlie. Hey, ready. They enjoying them? Good. They're very, very tiny. Tiny little spatula. Salads are always two pieces of dead lettuce. Salad dressing comes in that astronaut package so that as soon as you open it, it's on your neighbor's lap. Could I just dip my lettuce? That's all I have. That's a lovely skirt. What is that, silk? Should that happen, club soda will get that stain out immediately. That that will be the answer to anything you ask up there. Excuse me, I have an upset stomach. Club soda, be right back. Excuse me, I spilled something. Club soda, be right back. The wing is on fire. Club soda, be right back. They learn that in their training course. They learn that either right before or right after. They learn that little bye bye, bye bye now, bye bye, bye now, bye bye, bye now, bye bye, bye now, bye bye, bye bye, bye now, bye bye, bye now, bye bye, I love you, bye bye. Bye. You know they're just gonna snap one day. You'll find them walking along the street with a shopping cart. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. No more peanuts. Bye bye. I'm always seated next to somebody that feels like just because we're seated next to each other, we should form some type of bond with each other. You know, these people. I think it's obvious I don't want to engage in conversation. I'm wearing headphones, I'm reading a book, How to Overcome Your Hatred of Strangers on an Airplane. They're just right there. Where are you going? Where are you from? What do you do? no matter how friendly they are up there, when the plane is down, the relationship is over. I mean, they could have been chatting with you the entire time. Suddenly the plane's on the ground. Out of my way! Fuck you! Where am I going? <laughs> you were just telling me about your grandchildren. What happened, Gladys? <laughs> I think the bathrooms are pretty horrible if you have to use the bathroom at all. I... You go in there constantly lit, return to seat or return to cabin. Why do they think that has to be lit? Like if it wasn't lit, we'd relax in there for a little while. <laughs> Miss, bring my peanuts in here, please. This is beautiful. I could be the only one to get up out of my seat to go to the bathroom. Nobody else gets up. They could be sound asleep, you know? And I'm in there for what I think is 30 seconds. You have no concept of time when you're in there. It's like a casino. There's no windows, no clocks. You don't know how long you've spent in there. Now I open the door. Everyone on the plane is lined up, looking at their watches, making me feel like I've been in there forever. Now I've got to explain the smell that was in there before I walked in there. It's so unfair, isn't it? Because you just want to get out. You just want to leave. It wasn't you. You've held your breath, and now you open the door. Oh! <laughs> Look, there's an odor in there, and I didn't do it. <laughs> yes, it's bad. Yes. You might want to sprinkle some club soda. I I was flying the other day from Los Angeles to Chicago. 
and there was a fly on the plane with me. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever seen a fly? I, I just felt so bad. I thought this fly is going to be so confused when he gets to Chicago. <laughs> wandered all over the plane, you know, and then we opened, the doors opened, and we went out, and there were some flies holding a big welcome sign, so he was, he was going to visit friends, that was good, I was very relieved, they were hugging, blocking the whole way, everybody's trying to get around him, I learned, I, I always watch the Discovery Channel, which is a great channel to watch if you can't get Playboy, and, um, <laughs> I saw a special not too long ago on bees, so you'd think that I wouldn't really be frightened of them. I'm walking, the last time I was here, as a matter of fact, I was walking around this park area near where I was staying. I was in a great mood. It was a beautiful day. I was just so happy. I'm walking around, just happy, just whistling some new Metallica tune or something like that. <laughs> so I stopped to pick up a stone to throw it. Because you've seen people on TV when they're happy, they throw stones, and I thought, I'm that happy. So I stopped. <laughs> I'd never done it. I saw it on Andy Griffith and thought, I'll try it. So I get the stone and I just do that to get a little happy stone throwing motion. I hit a bee's hive in a tree. Man, oh man, I don't know if you've had this happen to you. Here's a, I was not the only one around. There were other people around, but they knew it was me. They knew, I mean, I tried to point to another woman thinking they would go to her, but there must be some little bee in the beehive just waiting, you know, it was her. And they just came at me, holding little sketches of me. Someone passed out really quickly. <laughs> artist rendering of me. Didn't even look like me in my opinion, but. <laughs> they go to your head, they go right to that, ah, that noise, they follow that. <laughs> I was in positions I have never in my life been in. I, normally I don't even consider myself that good of a dancer, but at this time, At one point he yelled out, can't touch that, or something. I just thought that would help, and then the little bees went too legit to quit, and they just came right at me. They didn't care. So now I'm just dancing, trying to get rid of the bees. Suddenly 20 black guys joined me. They were very good. They were behind me. Now we've attracted a, a, a group of people that kind of get in a semicircle. Go, Ellen! Go, Ellen! Get stupid! Go! So. Then I got into it. I, somebody say, ho! Say, ho! Say, ho! Ho! Now somebody, anybody, scream! That's what I did, and then everybody screamed like that, and then the bees scattered, so that was good. That worked out. I made 50 bucks. That's not bad, really. That's... Thanks. I had to pay the black guy, so I lost all the money, but they wanted to buy some outfits. So here's the thing what I learned from that. Because I went back to my room and, I, and there were really people that gathered across the park that saw me but they didn't see the bees and I thought these people thought I was retarded. They didn't see the bees. <laughs> and normally I would be so self-conscious about what they thought I was doing, you know. But when there's danger involved, you don't care what you look like. I mean, because usually when we do something stupid, we will do something else stupid just to cover for that stupid act <laughs> and then end up looking even stupider. Like, you know, you could be walking down the street Feeling pretty good, feeling, you know, like you're a pretty cool person in a good mood, just walking out. It just takes one little pebble. It just sucks the coolness right out of you, you know? And you can't just allow that to happen and go on. I mean, you know, if that happens, we'll try to cover for it. Nobody, you know, will just dance for a second or... Or we act like, I'm just gonna run anyway. I was just gonna start jogging. Like that helps the people across the way are going, oh, she tripped? No, she's running. <laughs> I thought she tripped, but she's running. <laughs> oh, we always look back like that, you know, lets everyone know. There's, I wouldn't trip alone. There's something there that caused me to, there's a pebble. If someone should put some orange cones up. Everyone is going to fall. <laughs> Tripping is okay because you can cover for it by the dancing or the running. Slipping is the worst. Slipping. <laughs> Because slipping, you're totally out of control, and then you're fine, you know? There's nothing you can do, unless maybe, like, every five feet, you do that again. Whoa! Just all the way home. You have to really commit to it, though, because if people see you stop before you get home, they'll catch on. 
because you don't want to look stupid. I mean, nobody, you'll do anything to, to cover for that. Like when you're driving in your car, do you like to sing to the radio or the tape that's on when you're driving? Yes, you do. I've seen you. Now, <laughs> it's one thing if the windows are down and people can hear the song and hear the music, you know, that's one thing. But you can't possibly feel more stupid than when you're sitting by yourself at a red light, windows are rolled up, you're sitting there alone. someone like that and think, what a goon. <laughs> then I drive off because I found that station. You always try to find out what they're singing to. You just keep hitting the button. I think I like to listen to lyrics. I mean, before, when, when we were younger, we didn't even question what we were singing, you know? I don't know if we thought that songs should have a storyline or something, but, I mean, Three Dog Night had that song, Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. Do you remember that song? <laughs> That's so scary that we all know that song, isn't it? That that was a popular song. It's amazing, you know? I mean, all you have to do is, to make a, a million dollars is write some song, you know, become a, a one-hit pony, I don't know if I made that up or not, but let's say I did. I mean, or, or you can like come up with some, the big thing now is like some stress reduction gimmick. They have so many of those that you just, you know, you get like a 1-800 number or something, sell those. They have now, I just read this in the back of a magazine, they have these goggles that you can put on to eliminate stress. You, you put them on, they're electronic, they're hooked up to something, they flash weird beams and colors of light in your eyes. They're $350. You know, I could just poke you in the eyes. I charge you 75 if that's going to help you out. That's, that's just how I am. But see, you know, you don't even have to do that. If you want to keep stress out of your life, you just exercise on a regular basis. You wouldn't even have to do any of those things. You just, that's the most important thing, too, they say. Because I, I lift weights. I do that uh, a lot. I lift weights religiously. I don't lift them every day. I hardly ever do lift them. But um, when I do, I go, Jesus Christ! They're heavy. <laughs> Hence the name. No, I, but that's not important. You can't just do that. You've got to get your heart rate going really, really fast. you got to do, and I try to jog and all that, but jogging, jogging is just, a, you get all sweaty and you have to come back to where you started from. So what I'm doing, I'll just have a friend drive a car really, really fast right at me and stop right before it hits me. You know, just... See you tomorrow. It's quick, it's cheap, it's easy. You don't have to buy all the clothes, you know, you just get a depend and that's it, really. You just a depend, some leg warmers, you're ready to go. That's a good look too. That really is, I find. My goal was to make you spit that beer out. I can't believe I even you were actually almost spitting it out and then the weird thing, you know, the, the weirdest stress thing that I ever did, because I do, I try all the things. There's something in uh, Northern California, uh, they're mud baths. I don't know if anybody has ever done the mud bath thing. Have you done it? Did you like it? It's, it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's, uh, did you have to get on the goat? <laughs> and sing the theme of Shaft? I thought that was odd. Um, no, what you do, though, you get in mud, which I know the name should have tipped me off, but I had no idea. I thought that smear it on me or show me photographs of mud. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you submerge in mud, you're naked, which they always want you to be naked to get rid of stress. Have you noticed that? <laughs> to me, that's more stressful, actually. You know, you're, you're naked around people you don't know who are naked. And you have no pockets. You don't know what to do with your hands. You're just kind of... <laughs> Do 
So you get the mud, you're naked, and uh, it's special mud. It's, it's $40 mud. You can't just roll around your lawn naked and get that same effect. I tried that, nothing happened. Well, I met some people. But, yeah. Well, very, very nice policeman. So, it's special. It's uh, peat moss and volcanic ash, and it's hot, so you sweat for 20 or 30 minutes. And supposedly what's happening for $40 is it's drawing the toxins out of your body. That's what they say is happening. The thing is, you're getting in right after someone else just got out of that same exact mud. So I don't know what you're drawing in from them exactly, but I can play the banjo now. <laughs> I'm not real good, but banjo lessons are about 45, so you save that five bucks. <laughs> ben. Now, were you hosed off, the people who did it? Yeah, it's, it's, they hose you off. They created a little job. They have these little hose girls. I'm, I don't know that's their title. They didn't have pens on or anything, but I'm, I'm naming them that. They have hoses. They have, they're 10 years old. They have a hose. You know, it's one thing to be naked in front of someone you don't know, okay? But to get hosed off by them... You know, you're standing there trying to act like it doesn't bother you, you know. So, how long have you worked here? <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Sorry. Um... <laughs> So then after you're hosed off, then you get in the shower. It's this tremendous cleansing process because after you've been sitting in mud for 20 minutes, mud gets in the darndest places, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> Weeks later, you're at the office typing, you're... <laughs> Betty, I feel peat moss. <laughs> peat moss, just get the hose out. Well, then get me some club soda. <laughs> <laughs>